Now in this video I'm going to show that we can uh, compute the posterior distribution in an iterative way in, in a manner which we call sequential Bayesian learning and um, well this really is one of my favorite examples from the book of Bishop. Now the example is as follows so we are presented with a sequence of observations so every time we observe an x an input x and a corresponding target value t and we model this so this is a synthetic data experience experiment we'll model uh, it's in such a way that each input x is uniformly distributed so x can take on any value between minus one and one equally likely and then there's a model like a, a ground root model that maps the input to a corresponding target but we put some measurement noise on top of it and this measurement noise is as usual Gaussian distribution get distributed with some uh, variance uh, on top of it and this ground truth model uh, f of x parameterized by a uh, will be given by a0 plus a1x so really we assume a linear relation or we model a linear relation between input x and uh, target t and in this experiment we will set these parameters a0 to be minus 0 0.3 and a1 to be 0 0.5 so this really this whole setup describes a joint probability distribution that really describes that the likelihood of observing an input variable x together with the target t and we, we try, our aim is to recover this uh, distribution now we're going to model this data distribution again via gaussians right so we assume this model, so we know that, that we are modeling a linear behavior between x and t. So our model will be of the form w0 plus w1 times x. And then we know that we can expect some noise, so we work with this predictive distribution that maps an x to a certain mean, and then we put a Gaussian around this uh, predicted uh, location, right? And this Gaussian has some uncertainty or some precision parameter beta associated with it, which reflects, which reflects the amount of noise in my data. And normally you wouldn't, this is a hyperparameter, normally you wouldn't know what the noise is, but now we do know. We know that the noise is going to be, it's going to have a variance of 0.2 squared. So that's what we are going to set this beta parameter to be. Okay, so our objective is to find the model parameters w0 and w1 that are most likely uh, to explain the, the observed uh, data points. So we hope that in the end we recover w0 to be minus 0 0.3 and w1 to be 0 0.5. But before we start, we haven't seen anything, we don't know anything. So we just assume a prior distribution stating that, well, my w is most likely to be centered around 0 and I have again some precision parameter which we set just to 2. Now this principle of uh, sequential Bayesian learning uh, revolves around the fact that um, when data arrives sequentially, the posterior of the n, is n minus 1 data points can be used as a prior for the arrival of the next data point. Uh, I, I'm just going to make that a bit more explicit for the case, so example for the case n is 2. Okay, so now I want to compute the posterior for my weights after having observed an x1 and an x2. I'm just focusing on the axis, not the targets now, it's just an example. So I want to compute the posterior for w given two observations of x. Now from Bayes' rule we know that the posterior is given by the likelihood times the prior and then divided uh, by the evidence. And we know also that the likelihood can be split into the product of these individual likelihoods, right? Because uh, the data was iid. So we have the likelihood for x2 given my model parameters times the likelihood of x1 given my model parameters times the prior for my model parameters described by some hyperparameter alpha. And this is then normalized by the evidence for x2 times x1 where again we can split this all into products because of the iid assumption now what we can see here just focusing on the x1 case this particular part this is the base rule for the posterior um, for my weights w given my observation of x so i can write this as follows so i have uh, the likelihood of x2 given my model parameters times the posterior for my weights after having observed uh, my x1 and this normalized by 
p of x2. So what we see here is that um, the posterior, after having observed x1, acts as a prior for the posterior um, after observed x1 and x2. Okay, so really in this update step, I'm going to use this base rule where this uh, green highlighted item acts as a prior for my, well, uh, the posterior that I want to compute, but it was actually given by the posterior after having observed x1. So this shows uh, that uh, I can have this sequential iterative update form. Well, for each update, I intend to update my posterior distribution. Um, everything I know before this point, before observing a new data point, will be used as a prior for this update, right? So it's prior knowledge before updating the single new data point. Okay, so let's make this a bit more explicit uh, with a, a visual example. So again, this was uh, how my data was generated. So just via a linear model with these coefficients and some noise uh, parameter. And then we have a prior, and initially we assumed it to be Gaussian distributed around zero with some uh, variance. So this, this is a visualization of the prior distribution for my weights W1, and red means it's very probable or very likely that my weights are going to take on these values. Uh, okay, so this is before having observed anything. Now, and just to visualize this, we can sample uh, Ws from this distribution according to these probabilities. So we can sample w and then we can plot the corresponding uh, functions, right? So that's what we do over here. So each red line means one set of parameters, like a, an offset, a bias, and a slope. And that gives me all these curves. Okay, and we see in re initially, like all my curves are completely different. Okay, and now we're going to make observations. So we're going to observe, observe our first uh, data point, an x1 and a corresponding t1. And we're going to use this new information to, to update the probabilities for, well, the values that W uh, should take. So we are, we're going to do this via base rule. So that we need to know the likelihood. And we said the likelihood was Gaussian distributed. So the likelihood of T1, given my model D0 plus W1 times X. So that will give me the mean value and the precision parameter uh, beta or this is the variance. Okay, so this is um, the likelihood for having observed an X and a corresponding T given my model parameters. And now my data point is fixed and now I can, I can evaluate this for all possible W values. And that's what you see over here. So the W values that uh, really give a high likelihood of observing this data point is, is given in red. Okay, and then I know from Bayes rule that the posterior is proportional to uh, the product of the likelihood of T1 given my X1 and my X1 and my model parameters and hyperparameter beta times the prior, uh, my prior knowledge for W that I had so far. Okay. And visually this means that I have uh, the prior, which I'm going to multiply with the likelihood, and this gives me the updated posterior. And of course, I only multiplied so far, and in, in order to fully turn this into a distribution, it has to be normalized, right? Uh, usually, for the full Bayesian update rule, I normalize with the evidence. But let's uh, let's ignore the, the normalization concept for now. We can always normalize this thing. So this now represents a posterior distribution. So after having observed my data, I refine uh, the probabilities for W and it, it's going to now look like this. So it's sort of zooming in on this area. So I expect my W's to take values with high probability somewhere uh, over here. Okay, now to visualize this, we can again, again sample points from these distributions according to this uh, probability. And that gives me these solutions. And we see that each set of W gives me a line which tends to agree at least on this data point. Okay, and that's also the only information that we have. So that's a nice result. And now we continue observing data points. So now we are presented with a new data point, x2 and t2. And now we're going to again update our posterior uh, using this sequential learning a principle which I started off with. So this is what we had so far. We start off with a prior and we multiplied it with the likelihood after observing x1 and t1. And that gave me this posterior. 
Now this posterior is going to act as a prior for my new update step, right? So I'm going to multiply it with the likelihood of observing x2 given my model. So for different model parameters, um, for different model parameters, this will the, be the likelihood for observing x2 and t1. And of course, multiplying now again this uh, this particular prior with this likelihood will give me the updated posterior. So we see that we now really start to zoom in on the actual model parameters. And again, remember that this uh, posterior, so this was the posterior after observing x1, it takes on the interpretation of the prior from my new update step, right? Because this is what I now observe. And before I observed this thing, this was all I knew. So this x as a prior. So we have this prior times likelihood gives me the new posterior. Okay, I think I forgot to mention this, uh, but this data point is given by this data point in this plot over here, right? So now again, if we just randomly sample points from this uh, newly obtained posterior distribution or randomly sample weights, uh, model weights from this posterior distribution and draw the corresponding lights, they look like this. So they all tend to agree on both data points, but still there is quite so, some noise in there. But at least we start zooming in on the actual solution. And just to recap the update rule here, so my new posterior was given by the likelihood of t2 given the corresponding x2 and given my model parameters times the prior and the prior which we had so far was actually the posterior given my previous data point t1 x1 t1 and the corresponding hyperparameters okay and we can of course keep on doing this so let's say we at some point have observed the t1 x1 t1 up to uh, 19 of these observations and, and we iteratively update the posterior. So we started off with, uh, this was after having observed one data point. This is after having observed two data points. And we keep doing this and at some point we have this posterior after having, having observed 20 data points. So these 20 data points there are uh, plotted over here. And these red lines are again some random samples drawn from this distribution. And you see that they all tend to agree very much. They are very similar and they all pass through these uh, data points. But the important thing to observe here that is that my posterior distribution really sharpens up, it really zooms in uh, to a particular region. So my posterior becomes sharper and sharper with more and more data that I present uh, this algorithm. So which really gives me the impression that if I keep on observing data for let's say an infinite amount of times, then this region really shrinks to a single point so it really shrinks to a single solution. Now let's see if we can figure out what this solution is going to be. And I'm re again reminding you here that we're working with Gaussian distributions, right? So for every update step, uh, we have an analytic description of the posterior. Uh, so I just showed that I could do this iteratively, but still we could also do this in one step, right? I have having, by evaluating this um, design matrix for all data points and then compute uh, the means of my posterior and uh, the covariance matrix of my posterior via these rules uh, that we obtained and discussed before. Okay, so then let's let's see what, what happens to the covariance matrix of my posterior distribution. So the formula for the posterior distribution was given as follows. Now what happens if n goes to infinity? If n goes to infinity, then this design matrix has an infinite amount of, of columns, right? An infinite amount of data points then this product is going to scale with the number of data points, right? Because I have a sum of all these um, row, column, row, column multiplications where I have n of these rows and columns. So really this thing is going to scale with n. So I'm going to write this here. So this limit, if n goes to infinity, is going to scale uh, with n. So uh, uh, this is a proportionality uh, symbol. It's not, not alpha. Um, so maybe that's a bit confusing with respect to this thing. Um, but this alpha doesn't play a role in the limit when n goes to infinity, right? Because this term is going to scale with n, so it's going to tend to go to infinity, so it will be much larger than, than this thing. Um, so S inverse is going to be dominated by this thing. So we have one over a thing that goes to infinity. So we see that in the limit, my covariance matrix uh, uh, converges to this zero matrix. So this is a zero 
matrix, right? The covariance matrix is a matrix. So this indeed tells me that in the limit when n goes to infinity, I do get a, an infinitely sharp distribution because the covariance matrix shrinks to zero. All right, so we visually saw this, but now we can also confirm this uh, analytically. Okay, now let's see what, what happens with um, my mean. So, so I have an infinitely sharp distribution, but around what weights will this uh, distribution be, be centered? So we take now the limit from n to infinity of my mean. Uh, my mean is given via this formula over here. So I'm going to take the limit of n goes to infinity of uh, beta times a covariance matrix inverse. So let's fill that in. That's this thing over here. So that's alpha times identity plus beta. Okay, so this is my expression for the mean and I'm going to take the limit where n goes to infinity. Um, so this means that this term is going to dominate, right? We just uh, saw that. This term is going to dominate so we can ignore this uh, alpha term over here. So what we get is the limit and goes to infinity of beta divided by beta phi transpose phi inverse phi transpose t. And of course these betas cancels out. So one of the, these betas, this one comes from here. We take the inverse so we can take this beta outside. So let's just clean it up. Let's just remove it. Okay, so this will be, in the, the case of n goes to infinity, my solution for the mean uh, will converge to this thing. And again, we've seen this thing before. What is it? <laughs> yes, precisely, it's going to be the maximum likelihood solution. Okay, so this is really nice. So in this uh, maximum posterior case, we see that if we observe more and more data points, it means that uh, my distribution posterior becomes sharper and sharper and starts zooming in on, on a particular uh, solution. It starts zooming in on the maximum likelihood solution. Now I really like this because now we've seen so far that we have that both uh, the, ba the Bayesian solution as well as the maximum posterior solution as well as the maximum likelihood solution all agree in the case when my number of observations tend to go to infinity. Okay, so this really means that in this Bayesian framework, um, I can assume some prior, and this helps me a lot when I have uh, little data. Um, but whatever prior I choose, if I get more and more and more data observations, then my solution in the end converges to the maximum likelihood solution.